Okay. You guys hear me? Yep. Okay, great. And you can see my slides. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I am going to give um, a quick talk on some kind of key aspects of ref uh, refractory hypoxemic uh, respiratory failure, which is near and dear to everybody's heart right now. Um, but there'll be a couple of topics that um, I'm not going to cover because we have other um, excellent speakers who will be covering those topics. So, um, uh -oh. Okay, here we go. Um, so, you know, um, everybody is often familiar with this mnemonic of the, the six P's of refractory uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure and approaches that you can take uh, to optimize your patient. Um, and it's a helpful framework to, to remember um, kind of various approaches that you have, including fluid management, PEEP titration, paralysis, uh, proning our patients, pulmonary vasodilators, and then percutaneous options uh, or ECMO. So today we're just going to talk about uh, PEEP titration, paralysis, and pulmonary vasodilators because there is a separate fluid management uh, lecture, a se completely separate uh, lecture all about proning, and then a separate talk about ECMO. So uh, first to talk about PEEP, um, this is a huge topic. There's a lot to say about it. So we're gonna do kind of a quick uh, overview of some kind of big highlights. So um, when you think about PEEP titration um, and ventilating your patients, um, I, I always like to uh, use the analogy of a balloon and thinking about um, in blowing up a, a, a balloon, um, and using that as an analogy for, for your lungs. So thinking about the, the most deflated balloon here on the farthest left side of the screen, and um, as you blow up, start to blow up a balloon, thinking about how kind of the very initial phases, you have to exert a fair amount of force into the balloon to get it to start to inflate. And then when you're in the middle, the two middle balloons, um, you are exerting kind of a moderate amount of force and the balloon is expanding nicely and it's easy to blow it up. And then again, at the far right of the screen, the, the in really inflated balloon, once you reach that point, how you, you're starting to exert a lot of pressure or force again, but the balloon doesn't really change in size. And that's kind of the entire concept of PEEP. You want to avoid the two extremes, the, the, the left balloon, the deflated balloon, and the overfilled balloon. You wanna find that sweet spot in the middle where the balloon is, has some air in it and it's at its most stretchy point. So kind of the most compliant or stretchy balloon and you wanna deliver your tidal volume on top of that stretchiest point. <laughs> So uh, in a slightly more scientific graphic, um, this is a kind of a volume of graft against pressure. Um, and this bottom curve here is um, inflating the lungs. And then this top part of the curve here is uh, deflating or exhalation of the lungs. Um, and again, a similar, similar thing as to what I just said about the balloon. At this very bottom part, initially, as you're delivering pressure, your pressure changes, so you're moving along this x-axis, but you're not getting a whole lot of volume. There's not a lot of movement up, up and down on the y-axis. Until you hit this point right here that's labeled LIP in this graphic from this study, um, which is the lower inflection point, after which all of a sudden a large number of alveoli are recruited and the slope of this line changes so that for every increment and an incremental change in pressure you get a fair amount of volume for that change and then again up here at this upper inflection point um, the same thing starts to happen where you're delivering a fair amount of pressure or using a fair amount of pressure for not very much volume and so kind of um, early, um, early studies and early approaches to PEEP titration were to find or estimate this lower inflection point based on various um, uh, maneuvers that can be done on a ventilator and to set PEEP to that, that pressure point plus two centimeters of water uh, because it, it was felt that this is the point where the most alveoli were recruited um, and you're on the stretchiest part of the balloon. So the, the, the lungs were most compliant at this point. 
So how do we choose our PEEP? And um, this, this too is a large topic of conversation. There's a lot of different techniques. Um, and I'll just kind of briefly touch on some of the ones that you may have heard about. The easiest one to kind of conceptualize and think about is here in the green box in the top right corner, um, which is the ARDSNET low PEEP and high PEEP tables. So when the ARDSNET trials were done um, in the early 2000s, late 90s to early 2000s, this uh, was one approach, or this was the approach actually to, to choosing PEEP uh, for patients with ARDS. And it was arrived at by expert consensus. It's not been studied. Um, and uh, patients were, were truly just placed somewhere in one of these boxes and increased um, or decreased PEEP and FiO2 uh, based on these parameters. And so patients with severe ARDS were treated with the high PEEP table and patients with moderate to, to um, uh, mild ARDS were kind of treated by the low PEEP table. So an easy framework uh, to, to go by. Um, what we might be more familiar with is uh, the best PEEP trial. That's what's used predominantly um, at Mass General um, and is talked about a lot. And that's here in this yellow box um, on, the, on the left side of the screen. And what the goal here is, is to choose a PEEP where the compliance or the stretchiness of the balloon is optimized, is at its most stretchy, so that when you deliver tidal volume on top of that, your low tidal volume that uh, Megan talked about yesterday during her ARDS talk, so that when that tidal volume is delivered, you're at the stretchiest part of the balloon and you're not straining the wall of that balloon. And so um, the, there's kind of a protocol for how this is done. Um, you know, there's different approaches to, to do this as well, which we will talk about briefly, but um, essentially setting the patient up at a high peep and slowly marching down on this table, recording the plateau pressure at each peep to find that difference, which goes in this column. Um, you have a set fixed tidal volume and you uh, calculate the compliance of the respiratory system or the stretchiness of the balloon with each uh, peep change. And then of course, um, monitoring things like uh, peripheral saturation and blood pressure. Um, so this is the approach that's um, commonly used and discussed um, uh, at MGH. These two um, other approaches down at the bottom um, here in the kind of um, peach box, this is called the stress index. This is using um, your, your pressure time curve on the ventilator to make an assessment of how, um, how well your patient is peeped. Um, this, just, this top part just suggests, um, is telling you that you set the ventilator at a constant flow, you deliver your tidal volume, and you look at the shape of the pressure curve the very end of the delivered breath. And here on the furthest right one, you can see that at the end of the breath, the, in, the uh, slope of this curve starts to increase. It kind of curves up um, suddenly, suggesting that the pressure um, that's being seen um, at the end of the breath is suddenly increasing, and that suggests over distension. Whereas the uh, curve here on the left side, as you're delivering your tidal volume or delivering your breath, suddenly towards the end, the pressure kind of flattens out. And this, uh, so this kind of flattening of the slope suggests that all of a sudden at the end, you've recruited more lung. Um, so perhaps your PEEP isn't high enough so that the resistance uh, of the system or the compliance of the system improves. Uh, so you wanna find that sweet spot where the, the stress index is uh, suggests that the slope is about one. Um, and this is just a graphic to talk about um, using esophageal balloons, which we do a little bit at MGH, but not quite as commonly, um, to estimate what the actual um, transpulmonary pressure is, so the pressure across the alveolar wall using an esophageal balloon to estimate um, the pleural pressure, which we don't need to get into in a whole lot of detail, but that's um, another approach. So how do we choose. There's these four ways, there's lots of other ways, of lots of graphical ways to choose PEEP, and the answer is that nobody knows, <laughs> and no one method of PEEP titration has ever been studied head-to-head, -head, has ever been, ever been looked at, um, so there's, it would not be fair to say that one method is better than another. 
what it is fair to say is that we have some data um, that suggests that monitoring this parameter called driving pressure, which I'm sure you guys have talked about on rounds taking care of these patients, um, is, is likely important. And so what driving pressure is, is the change in pressure, so the plateau pressure um, minus the, the PEEP that you've set for your patient. And this was a paper that was published in 2015, and this is the basis uh, for, for this approach. Um, and the paper is a complex statistical analysis that I won't uh, pretend that I understand everything that they did. But what they tried to do is they tried to look at delta P um, as a uh, separate parameter from uh, tidal volume, from PEEP, and see how uh, that predicted um, outcome or mortality, most importantly. So it suggested that changes in your tidal volume or changes in your PEEP, so things that we think about when we think about lung protective ventilation, were only helpful, only impacted slash improved your risk of death um, if they were associated with decreases in delta P. So meaning that if you decrease your tidal volume that you're delivering a patient from 6.8 cc's per kg down to 6 cc's per kg, for example, trying to follow that um, uh, low tidal volume parameter, that it was only helpful if the delta P went down. Similarly, you know, we think about increasing the PEEP, trying to recruit patients um, and uh, uh, to kind of Im improve the, the overall compliance. And that approach was only helpful if the delta P went down. Um, and so that's why this column here in the, in the best PEEP table um, is kind of thought to be the most important because this is, this is that driving pressure number. And as you titrate your PEEP, um, you want to optimize this driving pressure. And this is a graph from this paper um, that can kind of hopefully suggest why 15 is used as our cutoff. This is the uh, relative risk of death in the hospital here on the y-axis, and this is the delta P along the x-axis. And you can see that right around 15, um, you kind of have an inflection point and your relative risk of death goes up. Hey, Sasha, there's a couple questions, so I thought yep. it would be a good time to ask. The first one was, um, how do we check the stress index? Is it something that we can do on the vent, or does RT have to do it? So RT has to do it because you have to um, kind of play around with the knobs a fair amount. You have to deliver constant flow, which is not usually how the ventilator is set. The ventilator is usually sent to give kind of a ramped flow because that's more physiologic and it feels better for the patient to breathe. Um, so often um, you would need RT's help to kind of set those parameters. Um, and then because you set a square wave flow, some patients might find that uncomfortable. And so they may kind of fight the ventilator, try and take a breath on their own, uh, breathe in more air so the curves may be impacted. But if your patient's paralyzed, for example, or very deeply sedated and can tolerate it, um, it's definitely something that um, your, your friendly neighborhood respiratory therapist, I'm sure, could, could show you. But it's not something that we're really supposed to do on the vent because it requires some manipulation of, of various parameters. Thank you. And then the second question was, didn't the ART trial compare decremental PEEP titration to low PEEP? And how do we interpret this at MGH? Yes, it's like you see my my slides. <laughs> so I was going to talk about that next. Um, so this is a graphic from the from exactly that trial. This is the ART trial that directly compared um, kind of an approach that we actually use um, at, at Mass General. So a, a recruitment maneuver followed by a decremental PEEP trial versus using that low PEEP table um, from the ARDSNET trials. And um, the patients were kind of uh, uh, randomized to one group or the other, and they did a recruitment maneuver, which, um, you know, probably had some problems with it in and of itself and isn't exactly how patients are recruited, but you essentially increase the airway pressure to high levels for a period of time, um, and then set the PEEP at 25 or 30, and then start doing kind of decremental assessments and, and filling in that, that PEEP table, versus putting people just on the low PEEP um, ARDSNET table. And um, it showed that patients who were in the recruitment and uh, aggressive PEEP titration group had higher mortality. 
So this has kind of steered people, it was surprising, um, but has steered people away from, from doing this and doing it routinely. One thing I will say is that in this trial, when you compare the two groups after the recruitment maneuver, the driving pressure didn't change. So the driving pressure before recruitment and peep titration compared to after was uh, not statistically significantly different. I think the absolute difference was maybe one or two um, centimeters of water change in driving pressure. So that suggests that the recruitment maneuver didn't actually recruit lung because that's the whole point of doing a recruitment maneuver is that you recruit recruitable lung decrease the overall, I'm sorry, increase the overall compliance of the system, and then set the PEEP kind of at the, um, at the optimal level. So this, this, what this trial probably tells us is that doing a recruitment maneuver is not appropriate in all comers with ARDS. However, there still may be kind of a subset of folks who are recruitable um, for whom it would be appropriate. Sorry, was there another question, Laura? Or should I keep going? Nope, that's it. Keep going. Okay, perfect. Um, so this um, kind of open this kind of the, this is kind of uh, called the open lung approach. These um, high pressure recruitment maneuvers. Um, and they've, they've fallen out of favor. There were other early trials of, of high PEEP and recruitment maneuvers that didn't show benefit. And then this ART trial that suggested that there were harm. So because of that, our critical care guidelines for, for PEEP, um, which kind of fall in the middle of the graphic, um, is to actually start with the low ARDSNET PEEP table for, for that very reason. Um, and if there's persistent hypoxemia on those event settings, um, then at that point, it's very reasonable to consider um, with your respiratory therapist doing um, some sort of uh, PEEP optimization. Um, and the ART trial tells us that routine, so for all comers, and frequent recruitment maneuvers are not beneficial and may cause harm. It's, it is probably true that that signal towards increased mortality and increased harm is probably cumulative. So the more recruitment maneuvers, you're probably adding on additional risk. So it needs to be something that we think about carefully um, and certainly not something that we do frequently um, without a compelling uh, reason or clinical change. So that's what I have to say about PEEP. Um, I want to talk about paralytics. So um, thinking about our patients. So our patients are um, coming in, they're very hypoxemic, they get intubated, and they have um, you know, fairly high respiratory drive. And we put them on very low tidal volumes, which uh, probably feels quite uncomfortable to them. And so despite sedation, what can sometimes happen is this graphic here on the right, where um, your patient is intubated and sedated and getting low tidal volumes, but it doesn't feel good to them. And so they're still exerting some respiratory effort. Um, and so, you know, what we're trying to do with low tidal volume ventilation, PEEP optimization, like I said before, is to minimize the stretch essentially across this balloon wall so that the balloon doesn't pop, doesn't get injured. And um, that pressure is called the transpleural pressure and it's estimated by subtracting the pressure inside the balloon, which here is marked as PAW, um, minus the pleural pressure, which is the pressure outside of the, in, in the pleural space or outside of the balloon. And and um, if your patient is sedated but awake enough to exert respiratory effort, they'll contract their diaphragm, they'll use their intercostal muscles, and they'll generate very negative pleural pressures because they're trying to get more air than what we're giving them. And so what that does is that it makes that equation, that transpleural pressure of the pressure inside minus the pressure outside, which turns into a very negative number, very high, and that can be damaging. And so this is kind of the, the, the basis and the thought of using paralytics, where if you take all of that out, you don't let your patient participate at all, the pleural pressure goes way up and it can be you know, slightly negative to even slightly positive when somebody's sedated um, and intubated. And it makes your transpleural pressure or the pressure going across the wall um, much lower. Um, so there's two major trials to think about uh, when we think about paralysis. The first one is called 
Acuresis, it came out in 2010, a multi-center trial from France, um, where they randomized 340 patients to getting paralytics versus placebo <clears throat> after they were admitted um, and identified to have ARDS for less than 48 hours, and their P to F ratio was low, less than 150, and their PEEP was set at least at five. And what they did is they deeply sedated everybody. So this is the Ramsey sedation scale, which is different than what we use. We use the RAS scale. Um, but nevertheless, you can see that a Ramsey sedation scale score of six is no response to stimulus. So very deeply sedated these patients and then randomized them to either arm and made sure that their vent settings were similar, although they didn't have really formalized how they set PEEP, but kind of low tidal volumes. And then they titrated PEEP and FiO2 for um, for saturation goals. And they kept patients paralyzed for 48 hours and then unparalyzed them or kept them in the trial for 48 hours. And this trial suggested that there was a 9% um, absolute reduction in mortality in the paralytic, uh, in the paralyzed group. So the paralyzed group had a mortality of right around um, 32%, whereas in the placebo group, it was right around 41%. Um, the, the patients in the paralytic group had more days outside of the ICU. The rates of ICU acquired paresis by the time they left the ICU were about the same. Um, the patients who were paralyzed had more ventilator free days. And interestingly, the patients who were paralyzed had lower rates of barotrauma or lower rates of um, pneumothorax. Um, and this, this difference, this 9% reduction uh, was seen after they did some secondary statistical analysis to control for various parameters and it was most pronounced in patients um, who had the most severe ARDS with a P to F ratio of less than 120. So after this trial, um, people kind of felt like paralytics in certain clinical situations were, were appropriate if, if patients had very severe um, ARDS. The ROSE trial, however, that came out last year was a multi-center um, randomized control trial done in the United States where they ultimately enrolled just over a thousand patients and they randomized them to paralytics or usual care. Um, and these patients too um, had been diagnosed with ARDS um, and enrolled within two days of that diagnosis, a PDF ratio of less than 150 and a PEEP set greater than eight. And everybody was ventilated with a low uh, tidal volume ventilation and a high PEEP strategy. And then randomized to early neuromuscular blockade or usual care. And the patients who were paralyzed were deeply sedated because that is the appropriate thing to do. Um, but the patients with usual care had, um, were, were lightly sedated with a RAS goal of negative one to zero. And you can see here that there was no difference between the groups. So between those who um, survived, there was no difference in survival to hospital discharge between the intervention and the control group, um, and no difference in uh, the rates of patients who were discharged to home between the control and the intervention group. So um, this is just kind of a summary of that. No change in mortality, no difference in days outside the ICU. Um, there was more ICU acquired weakness in the paralytic group, no difference in ventilator free days, and really no difference in barotrauma. There was some um, kind of crossover uh, between the two groups. So 14% of the par paralyzed patients stopped the paralytics early and 17% of the controls ended up receiving paralytics. But nevertheless, this trial was actually stopped early um, due to futility. So after enrolling 1,000 of their target 1,400 patients, the, the trial was stopped. And uh, there were higher rates of cardiovascular complications in the, in the paralytic group, which was thought to be related to the heavy doses of sedation that were required. So things like bradycardia, hemodynamic issues, things like that. So the question is, why are these trials so different? And this is, um, this is a table, we're not gonna go into the details, but from a kind of a commentary um, paper published in the journal after the ROSE trial came out, kind of highlighting some of the differences. But you know, the, the trials aren't identical. ROSE had overall higher PEEP. Um, ROSE used much lower sedation in the, in the unparalyzed group. Acuresis was done um, uh, earlier when proning was kind of more um, popular and in France where, where patients are prone more commonly. And I think for me, one of the most um, important pieces to remember is that 655 patients who were um, eligible for ROSE couldn't be enrolled because the clinicians taking care of them had already given them paralytics. So that suggests that perhaps 
um, there was some pre-selection of patients who might benefit from paralytics that weren't included in the trial. Um, and so it, it, I think we have to um, interpret this with a, a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, and uh, I think most people um, who practice critical care will still reach for paralytics, um, kind of thinking about that very first cartoon that I showed you guys about um, patients who can be challenging to sedate, who um, are making a lot of respiratory effort early in their ARDS course um, and trying to minimize that, that um, transpleural pressure. So again, this is our uh, critical care guidelines and, uh, oops, sorry. And it says that uh, paralytics here for events, uh, dyssynchrony are not routine, um, but they don't make, you know, kind of an absolute yes or no recommendation about that. I'm gonna briefly talk about pulmonary vasodilators and then leave some time for questions. Um, the pulmonary vasodilator that we use most commonly um, these days uh, in, the, in the time of COVID is inhaled nitric oxide. So just to kind of quickly remind us all um, that it works by activating um, guanyl Cyc guanylate cyclase, which helps to form cyclic GMP, which um, impacts calcium um, entry into the cell. Um, so decreases intracellular calcium and, and causes uh, smooth muscle relaxation and vasodilation. So the way that it works, so here on the left, this is kind of a normally ventilated and normally perfused lung. You're, uh, you're um, ventilating normally, gas is reaching the <clears throat> the alveolar space, and then these capillaries, uh, this capillary alveolar interface participates in gas exchange normally, and so all the blood that flows past it is, is appropriately oxygenated. When you have ARDS or anything that causes alveolar filling, whether it's pulmonary edema or it's consolidation or it's blood or it's um, inflammatory cells uh, from infection or, or whatever it may be, this alveolus that's full can't participate in gas exchange. Um, and nevertheless, this blood that's flowing past it in this uh, capillary, um, you know, it comes out on the other end, not oxygenated, still full of, of carbon dioxide. And so what the goal of inhaled nitric oxide is, is because it causes vasodilation, is that it'll make this blood vessel bigger so it dilates this blood vessel and shunts blood preferentially into it because it then becomes a lower resistance vessel um, to enhance how much blood is flowing past um, uh, normally ventilated young lung units so it improves your EQ matching. Um, the other agent that we used more uh, before the time of COVID um, is inhaled evoprostenol or Velitri. Um, and just to briefly say that when these two agents have been looked at in comparison um, for specifically for hypoxemic respiratory failure, um, that there's been no difference between the two of them. Um, and the reason um, we don't, we're not using evoprostenol right now is because it requires a filter change with some frequency, which is an aerosolizing procedure. That's the reason we're using inhaled NO um, these days. I will say that inhaled ipoprostenol is cheaper than inhaled NO, so that is kind of why it was our convention uh, before. So what are the effects of inhaled pulmonary vasodilator? So there's um, been a Cochrane review on this issue. So inhaled pulmonary vasodilator specifically for ARDS or hypoxemic respiratory failure. And it's been updated three times, most recently in 2016. Um, that shows that it, it does improve oxygenation. So it will make your numbers look better. However, this review suggests that that lasts only for 24 hours. And then at 48 and 72 hours, that effect um, is no longer, um, no longer seen. Um, and it doesn't imp seem to impact any of our hard outcomes in the ICU. So using these agents does not affect mortality, and there's no significant effect on ventilator days, duration of me uh, mechanical ventilation, um, ICU or hospital length of stay. And interestingly, in this uh, systematic review, there's a statistically significant increase um, in the rates of renal failure in the inhaled nitric oxide treated groups. And the mechanism of that is completely unclear. Um, and it's actually contradictory to data um, from the um, cardiac surgery literature where inhaled nitric oxide is also used to, um, in, the, in the operating room to impact uh, VQ matching and things like that. And that actually shows a decreased rate of renal failure after cardiac surgery. So unclear what this means, but it's just something to be aware of. And so the question is, if it makes your numbers better, 
why doesn't it impact our outcomes? And there's a couple of thoughts on this. One is, is that in unselected patients with ARDS, so all comers with ARDS, when, when those patients die, the majority of them aren't dying of refractory hypoxemia. They're, refra they're dying from multi-system organ failure. That's a result of whatever the driver for their ARDS is. They're dying from multi-organ failure from the septic shock that's also causing ARDS or their pancreatitis or you know, what, whatever it is that's driving it. The other point is that um, the problem with um, oxygenation in these people is, is, some, is often not necessarily with oxygen delivery, but rather with oxygen consumption at the tissue level. So again, my example for, for severe sepsis, um, if somebody has you know, severe septic shock um, and has ARDS as well um, as a result of that, um, you know, no amount of oxygen is going to necessarily fix the issue at the tissue level of oxygen utilization and oxygen consumption. So the uh, enhancing the delivery by um, uh, providing inhaled pulmonary vasodilators may not help. And so it is possible that in a carefully selected group of ARDS patients, there might be benefits. So in a carefully selected group of patients for whom the issue truly is with oxygen delivery, that perhaps that is exactly the group for whom this is helpful. Um, and how about in COVID? So um, not a lot of data. As you can imagine, there was a small study during the uh, original SARS pandemic in 2004 that suggested that using inhaled NO um, decreased the duration of mechanical ventilation. This study had 14 patients in it. Um, there's in vitro studies that suggest that nitric oxide may facilitate antimicrobial and anti-tumor activity in macrophages, and that there's some suggestion that there's um, antiviral activity, including in uh, SARS-CoV. So that is why many of you are seeing um, uh, inhaled nitric oxide being used as part of the study right now at MGH. This is kind of the clinical trials um, picture from, from our current study that, that's ongoing um, at MGH, which is looking at Kind of both of those questions about oxygenation as well as um, the antiviral uh, activities. So <clears throat> just to be aware that there are some possible adverse effects of inhaled nitric oxide, um, there, there is the possibility of seeing paradoxical worsening of hypoxemia, um, you know, less likely for patients who that we're seeing who don't have a lot of other medical problems necessarily and are coming in just with ARDS from COVID, um, but it's hypothetically possible that if your patient has um, a history of heart failure and has a high left atrial pressure anyway, and you cause a lot of vasodilation and increased flow, that they could develop pulmonary edema, for example. There is a risk of developing methemoglobinemia with inhaled nitric oxide. So changing the um, confirm, uh, conformation of your heme, shifting your oxygen dissociation curve to the left. This has mostly been seen with high doses, so 80 parts per million or greater for a long time. Um, I will say that in the, in the trial, I believe the protocol um, is to have uh, your patients started on 80 parts per million, but they quickly um, go down from that. Um, so, but just to be mindful that this is something that can happen. Um, we often wean inhaled nitric oxide because there can be some rebound pulmonary hypertension or hemodynamic instability if, you, if it's uh, stopped abruptly, and then the renal dysfunction that we kind of briefly talked about. So to summarize, um, from, from a PEEP standpoint, no one method of PEEP titration has ever truly been shown to be better than another, um, and deriving pressure is probably an important thing to monitor. Um, paralytics are likely appropriate in select patients, but should not be kind of routinely or widely implemented. And then inhaled pulmonary vasodilators do improve oxygenation, but have not been shown to improve ICU outcomes in a very heterogeneous group of people. So, you know, these are the six Ps, and one of my residents on, uh, from my most recent service block suggested that there should be a seventh P, which is patients. <laughs> um, you know, these, these patients um, are, are COVID patients. It, it really does seem like they're taking a long time to recover. They are very sensitive to, to small changes, and so remembering that um, you know, a lot of this just requires time. Great, thank you so much, Sasha. That was a great review. Um, uh, we'll take some questions now. We only have a few minutes, so if there are more questions that we don't get to, um, I'll ask you to email either me, uh, Laura Brenner, or um, Alexander Wong, the 
Andrew Wong, who gave us this lovely lecture. Um, and we'll try to either answer by email or maybe at the beginning of the lecture tomorrow, we'll try to answer some questions um, if, if we don't get to them now. So if you can leave messages in the chat, we can try to get to them in the next few minutes. Or if you don't have any questions, then I... <laughs> that, that's mm -hmm. good too. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to go with that, but I just wanted to give you guys a chance. Um, I hope everyone has a great day and stay safe. All right. Thank you guys.